CCDC, the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, presents wills and advanced medical directives with Chris Brock, CCDC probate power. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi everyone, my name is Julie Riskin. I'm the director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And I wanna thank you for joining our webinar. We're starting to do these on a regular basis. And um, there is nothing like a global pandemic to remind us all that the unexpected can happen and that preparation is a good thing, not a bad thing. So in light of that, um, we are um, offering this uh, program today on advanced directives and particularly with a health related emergency going on it's super important that people with disabilities all of us that we uh, that we think about what we want if we were to not just get covid but to get sick um, but particularly covid um, what we want um, who we want to make decisions if we can't speak for ourselves because usually if you're at the point of needing a ventilator or something you can't speak for yourself and what decisions that we want to make ahead of time and what decisions we want someone else to make because we don't know what things might look like. So we're very lucky. We've had a program at CCDC for a few years now called Probate Power. And that is um, Chris Brock is our managing attorney. And what Probate Power does is it provides probate law services to people with disabilities. And that's anything from advanced directives, wills, uh, special needs trusts, ABLE accounts, um, uh, anything in that, that arena. And we started this because we saw that there was a lot of people doing probate law, but it was all called elder law. And we realized that people with disabilities of all ages needed these services and thought that we were uh, uniquely qualified to provide them. And um, had some people agree with us and help support getting it up and running. So we're very pleased that we have this, this level of expertise on staff now so that we can help out our community during, during this crisis. So uh, without any further um, comments, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to Chris Brock, who will be our presenter today. This is um, captioned. If anyone, there's a link in the chat to get the captioning. Um, and the captions will be embedded in the recording. Uh, hello all, uh, my name is Chris Brock. I am, as Julie said, I'm the managing attorney of CCDC Probate Power, um, our social enterprise at CCDC. I've been doing this over three years now. Um, so uh, every day I deal with these sorts of issues advanced medical directives, wills, special needs trusts, guardianships, um, the like. Today, we're gonna to focus on advanced medical directives and wills. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about advanced medical directives um, and what they are, the various different kinds, and kind of what you may need um, if some, to put in place so that if something does happen to you, that um, all of your decisions all of your wishes are, are followed, basically. Um, after you talk about that, we're gonna to touch on wills just a little bit, because now it's always a good time to you know, make sure all your assets go to where you want them to go, and that you have everything um, planned out in case something happens. Um, so uh, hopefully, people out there are practicing social dis distancing and um, you know, infections decline, and that uh, we don't need to put these documents in um, into effect when um, we don't need people um, that have to worry about this stuff. But uh, reality is that many people will get sick and some will die. And um, so we need um, the correct documents in place so that you can avoid wrong medical decision being made. Um, and just, uh, just for clarification, this presentation is just for informational purposes only. It is not, should not be construed as legal advice. Um, later on, if you want to have a, a conversation with me, a consultation uh, regarding um, these documents, um, we can do that. We can set something up uh, over the phone or whatnot to uh, move forward on um, a possible legal uh, relationship. Um, if you already have some of these documents, fantastic. Um, my advice is to make sure you review them. Uh, I would, you know, today if you do, if you have them, to make sure they are consistent with your wishes. Um, 
Also, if they're older than 10 years old, I would advise you to get new ones, just update them, um, because having new versions of these documents um, is always good to have. So uh, the first document I'm gonna talk about is a medical power of attorney. Um, in this document, let me, I'm gonna do a screen share so you can kind of see what one looks like. Um, let's see. All right, here we go. So this here is a medical durable power of attorney. Um, it's pretty straightforward. There's some alternative language in there. Um, but so a medical power of attorney, what this does is it's a document that you, in which you appoint an agent to make medical decisions for you when you are incapable of making those decisions on your own. So you fill this out when you have um, capacity and you want to name somebody as an agent to make those decisions for you. And um, such decisions would be things like medical treatment, medications, surgeries, um, amputations, hospice care, ventilation, etc. cetera. Um, so you use this document, you name an agent and you name a successor agent that will follow through on the best, um, follow through on your wishes and what's in your best interest if you're unable to make medical decisions on your own. Um, you need to be 18 to be able to fill this out and have what's called decisional capacity, which means you need to be able to understand what you're signing and filling out. Um, like I said, you name an agent and a successor agent. The reason why you do this is, let's say you name your spouse as your agent. Well, if both of you end up getting COVID and both of you are in the hospital, then you need a successor agent there that can also make decisions for you if you're unable to. Um, a standard medical power of attorney is pretty broad, like I said, and covers a lot of medical decisions, um, but it, you can narrow it in scope if you would like. Um, in terms of execution, um, you need to sign it yourself, and I, the best practice is to have a notary and two wit witnesses sign it as well, but in Colorado, that is not necessary. Um, in today's world of social distancing, in, in today's world of social distancing, um, it's not always easy to have a notary and two witnesses in your house or meeting them at an office. So it's just much, much easier a lot of times just to sign it yourself and fill it out and make sure it says what you want to say. And it is legal um, without needing a notary or, or witnesses at this time. In a medical power of attorney, you can also discuss uh, organ donation. You can, um, like, yeah, organ donation, name and successor. You can make it as narrow or as broad as you would like. So, regardless of if you are sick or if you think you're going to get COVID or if you're as healthy as you've ever been, um, having a medical power of attorney is really a necessary document because you never know if you're going to get in a car wreck. You never, I mean, you never know if you're, something's going to happen to you and you're going to wind up in the hospital and not be able to make decisions for yourself. And you need somebody there who make decisions on your behalf. Um, if you, by the way, if you have questions, uh, I'm going to cover all the advanced medical directives and we can then answer questions regarding those. And then I'll go in the wills. And then after that, we'll answer any questions regarding wills as well. So in order to complete a medical power of attorney, uh, you can fill it out yourself. You can um, go to an attorney to fill it out like me. Uh, right now at CCDC, we are offering medical durable power of attorneys for free. So if anybody needs them, you contact us and we'll uh, get you set up so that you can have that to make sure that you have an agent named in case something happens. The next document I'm going to talk about is called a living will. It's also called an advanced directive for uh, medical decisions. And people get a living will confused a lot of times with other advanced directives. So I'm going to show you what a living will looks like. So this here is a living will advanced directive for medical surgical treatment. So a living will is only for a very narrow set of circumstances regarding end of life decisions. So it, it only comes into play if you uh, have a term, terminal condition 
or are in a persistent vegetative state and um, need to make end of life decisions. So if you're in a persistent vegetative state or in a term terminal condition, your living will specifies whether you want life sustaining procedures or artificial nourishment um, to be continued for you. So in a living will, you can say I'm in a terminal condition and I'm unable to make decisions, unable to communicate my decisions, and thus I want life-sustaining procedures withdrawn right away. I want life-sustaining procedures withdrawn after a period of time, let's say 30 days, or I want life-sustaining procedures continued indefinitely. Um, same for artificial nutrition or hydration. Um, and then again, same for persistent vegetative state, same two questions. So it, a living will concerns end of life decisions regard when you're in one of these two uh, conditions. So a living will only operates when you're in one of these two conditions. It's, it, like I said, it's pretty narrow of what it can do. One important part of a living will is that here, you can actually write in other directions you may have when you're in one of those conditions. So in here, you can write, hey, I don't want any blood transfusions. I don't want any sort of advanced, I don't know, dialysis or antibiotics or anything that's not going to keep me from pain. You know, say you can put in here, all I want is the palliative care. All I want is pain management. I want nothing else. Um, you can say that. Um, so that's kind of what a living will is for. It also allows you to put in interested parties that you may want to be able to communicate with your doctors who do not have that power otherwise. So when you have a medical, an agent under medical power of attorney, they have the power to speak to your doctor on your behalf, to access your medical record, records, those sorts of things. In your living will, you can also write in the name of other people who you may want to be able to speak with doctors. They will not have decision-making capability, but they will be able to speak with the doctors to understand your um, condition and what is going on with you. In a living will, you also can um, discuss whether you want organ or tissue donation and alike. Get off the screen there, okay. So, um, Yeah, like I said, with living will, you determine if you want life-sustaining procedures done continued indefinitely, continued for a number of days, or uh, um, stopped right away once doctors have determined that he or she is in a terminal condition or a persistent veg vegetative state. So in order to um, educate, um, um, in order to draft and execute, that's the word I'm looking for, in order, in order to execute a living will, you need to sign it, and it requires two witnesses. So unfortunately, a living will um, doesn't necessarily help in these times of social distancing. So uh, even though um, the medical power of attorney doesn't need a notary or witnesses, a living will does require two witnesses. And those two witnesses cannot be your doctor, an employee of a doctor or healthcare facility that you're a patient in, cannot be an individual who may have a claim against your estate, and cannot be a beneficiary of your estate. So it cannot be your child, it cannot be your possibly your sibling. So it needs to be two essentially uninterested witnesses. So in the time of social distancing, dealing, trying to get two witnesses, um, there are ways to do that. You know, you can fill out the document yourself, uh, step away from the document, have somebody come in with a different pen, sign as a witness, step away from the document, a second witness comes in with a different pen, sign in, sign as a witness on the document, some variation of that to um, get the two witnesses on the, on the living will while still trying to maintain as much social distancing as possible. So those two documents, medical POA and the living will, uh, is something you can do through an attorney, through us at CCDC, and, um, or complete on your own. Uh, the living will, like the medical POA, we are doing for free at this time to make sure that people have that document in place. 
there are a few other advanced medical directives that individuals should look into and possibly complete, um, and I will run through them. Each of these documents are documents that you will fill, it, fill out with your physician, either your PCP or another physician, nurse practitioner, PA, somebody that you uh, interact with, you're comfortable with, and you can receive medical advice for. The first document is called a most form or a medical orders for scope of treatment. Um, so essentially this form is a two page document that you complete with a doctor and it tells emergency medical personnel and other healthcare providers whether to administer CPR and other, and other wishes such as intubation, antibiotic use, feeding tubes, et cetera. So it's similar, there's some overlap between this and a living will, but it doesn't replace a living will in terms of what each, each of them do. Um, the most form, it essentially, once you complete it and you sign it and it's signed by a medical professor, a uh, medical profession, professional, it, it becomes a medical order written by that doctor. So it um, essentially follows you to whatever um, facility you may be at as a medical order. Um, like I said, it must be signed by a physician, either MD or DO, a, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or somebody of that, um, that, that, that has that sort of um, education, that sort of um, certification. So it's not a document necessarily to be filled out by a lawyer or somebody else like that. It should be filled out by somebody who can offer medical advice. Um, typically, the most form is primarily intended for the elder, elderly, chronically, or seriously ill individuals who are in contact frequent, frequently with health care providers. Um, so if you are immunocompromised and you say, well, if I get the COVID, I'm going to be in a hospital, then the most form is probably a, something to look into with your doctor so that um, you have your wishes made out um, in case you end up going into the hospital for it. Uh, another document to look into is what's called a CB, CPR directive. Um, and this, a lot of people probably knows what this is, and it's just a document that you draft, you write and signed by you and a an attending physician, and essentially it's a guide in which it's something in which you give guidance to emergency service personnel whether to administer CPR to you. So it um, it essentially instructs in you know uh, e EMS who comes to your house and if you're in cardiac arrest. Uh, this document says I don't want any CPR. I don't want anything to that effect. Um, if my heart stops uh, beating or if I stop breathing, then, uh, then let nature take, take its course. I don't want any measures beyond that. Um, typically, when people have these in place, you want to make sure they are somewhere prominent in your house so that if emergency personnel do, does come to your house, that they see it right away. Because they're not, you know, you're, if you're in cardiac arrest on the, the floor, they're not going to be searching through your files looking for whether you have a CPR directive. So you want to make sure if this is really important for you to make sure it's very prominent. Uh, a lot of people put on their refrigerator, put a sign on their front door, say, hey, I have a CPR directive on my fridge, um, on my end table, something like that, so that EMS knows whether to administer CPR or not. Because if they don't see something right away, they're going to administer CPR. You know, they're trying to save a life a lot of times. A similar order is a DNR, or a do not resuscitate, or a DNI, a do not intubate. And these are similar documents, but these are executed within a medical facility. So um, if you're in the hospital and you are afraid that you're just going to get worse and worse and you don't want to be intubated and you don't want to be uh, resuscitated, you, that's when you go to your doctor and say, hey, let's do a DNR, DNI, because we don't want, I don't want any measures done. I've had a good life, let just na nature takes it, take its course there. So in, instead, that's roughly five different documents, advanced medical direct directives for you to list your medical wishes on. 
the most important thing is to make sure these are consistent. So if you do not want to be uh, on a ventilator, let's say, um, make sure you, when you fill out your medical power of attorney document, you tell your agent, hey, I do not want to be on a ventilator ever, period. So make sure you know this, make sure when we go to the hospital, that that's the first thing you say to my doctors, my nurses. Um, in your living will, make sure it says no extraordinary measures. I don't want to be on a ventilator, don't want any life-sustaining procedures, no feeding tube, et cetera. And if you decide to fill out a most form as well, make sure your most form is very clear, no ventilation, um, no extraordinary measures. So you want to be consistent across all of your documents so that there is no confusion and so that doctors and nurses are, it's very clear to them that the that this is your wish because their first instinct is to save your life to do cpr to do ventilation and unless it is extremely clear to them in a document signed by you they're going to go ahead and do it because they won't turn they're trying to save a life and that's what their first instinct is so like i said you want to be very clear the best way to go about this um, is you want to make sure all of your documents that you have to have printed copies of them in a folder with you. So either in a big bright green envelope, bright, bright green folder next to your uh, bags that you always take with you when you go anywhere, um, underneath your wallet, you know, staple or um, on the magnet on the fridge, make sure your agent or your medical POA has a copy so that when you go to the hospital or EMS takes you to the hospital, that they the documents go with you and that your agent knows has copies all these documents and can bring them to you to the hospital so that there's no confusion on what's going on here um, in today's world of COVID-19 and social distancing um, if you're in a hospital it's likely your agent won't be in the same hospital room with you that they will be out in the waiting room or some other room for families and will not be able to communicate directly with you um, if you're in the hospital. So you definitely want to speak with them beforehand about what's going on so that if something happens and you're unable to make those decisions, your agent has a really good idea of what you want. Um, and you also want to make sure that um, most, so most documents today, um, medical POAs, living wills, do not really mention how any forms of communication of how to um, speak with your doc doctors and nurses. Uh, most of these documents anticipate is going to be face to face. So sometimes, so if you have a medical POA um, that you've, that's been drafted, you want to make sure that you can also speak to the doctor using other forms of communication through that document. So whether it be a telephone, email, FaceTime, Zoom, anything like that. Because I think most medical POAs right now do not anticipate um, not being able to speak to people in person. Uh, so this is a very unique situation. So I would advise if you have a medical POA to get a new one and make sure um, uh, there's a new provision in there that says that your agent can make decisions over the phone via email facetime etc um, not saying that it's not allowed there's nothing in the law that it does not allow that but i think it would make it easier if your medical boa is very clear that decision making via um, non non-in-person um, communication works so uh, like I said, make sure all your advanced medical directives are consistent and in line with your wishes so that all documents are clear and that mistakes are not made. Um, if there are any questions on advanced medical directives, I'm willing to, I'd be happy to answer them right now. You can either get on off mute or chat or throw it in the chat. Okay. Um, if you do have questions later on, you can shoot me an email 
CD Brock at oh I got a question CD Brock at CCDC online uh, dot org. So Christine said, "How long are you offering for free?" Uh, that's good. Good good question. Uh, I would say at least over the next two months. So it's today, uh, March thirty first. So let's say through the end of May, um, uh, permitting. Um, so doing uh, free medical POAs and living wills to make sure uh, our community has them um, so that their people's wishes are clear. And I'm gonna throw in my email in the chat so that people have it. There you go. Yes, as Julie says, people who can afford to fit pay are welcome to make a donation because we, you know, we are a nonprofit and we, unfortunately or unfortunately, we live and die on people's generosity and you know, of, of donations and grants, um, which is the, um, the great thing about you know, CCDC. Yeah, so if there's no questions right now about advanced medical directives, uh, oh, got a question. What happens if you aren't unexpectedly incapacitated? Does POA fall into the spouse's hands? So, uh, James, so you're, uh, what I'm understanding is you're saying if you don't have a POA, is that what you mean? Yes. So if you don't have a medical power of attorney and something happens, you become incapacitated. Generally, yes, your spouse would be the first person in line to make your medical decisions for you. Um, so it's not always, it's not dire if you become incapacitated, you don't have a medical power of attorney, but you're married because then your, your wife can step in, your, your husband can step in and make those decisions for you. Unless you, you don't a, want them to step in, right? What's that? Unless you don't want your spouse to step, I mean, there are yes. people who are in a, they might still be married, but maybe in an abuse situation and they might really not want their spouse. So if that's, if that's your situation, it is dire. Right. right. Well, yes, that's true. Uh, you definitely want to, if there is a situation where the next person in the line is somebody you don't want to, want to make those decisions, then you definitely want to draft a medical POA um, and get it in place. I always say that uh, even if you are married, getting a POA in place as soon as possible is great because it's very easy to see both of you being in a car wreck together and both of you getting a TBI or something, and then who's gonna make those decisions. Yes, a lot, there is a, if you don't have a medical POA, there is what's called a med medical proxy, and in which somebody gets nominated uh, among your family members or close friends, who can act as your medical decision maker for you, but you're kind of leaving that up to chance because you don't know who's gonna wind up at the hospital uh, when you get there. It could be, you know, if you have three kids, and maybe one of them is probably not the best decision maker on that, but he's the one that lives closest and he's the one that get gets to the hospital first. You know, that may not be the, the decision that you would have made yourself. So you want to be careful with that. So getting a POA in place to make it very clear of who you, you your um, agent and successor agent are is very important. Uh, can your spouse ask for the medical POA enacted? Mm, uh, essentially, no. So if you do not um, sign a medical power of attorney on your own, you cannot have somebody really sign it for you. Um, it, this is your decision-making uh, ability to do it. So you want to do it on your own. Yeah. Okay. All right. So a little bit about uh, wills. So um, like all these advanced medical directives I spoke about, you have to be 18 in order to uh, fill one out. Uh, same with wills. With a will, you have to be 18 and you have to have, um, you have to be of sound mind is what they mean to say. When, when people say of sound mind, essentially the law says that the person has to be able to identify his or her family, identify his or her assets, and describe how the assets should be distributed through their will, okay? So a will should be in writing and signed by the 
testator or in the testator's name by an individual in their presence. Uh, I'm sorry, I got a question, another question about the medical POA. Can your medical POA ask that they are talked to instead of the individual? I'm not sure I understand the question, James. If you wanna clarify, that'd be great. Um, um, but uh, we'll get back to that. So when it comes to a will, you have to be- I think I understand it, Chris. Oh, you do? I'm sorry, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, I, it says, um, I think what he's saying is, could your spouse ask for the mer medical POA? C could your POA ask the, so let's say that you can talk, but you might be very sick. Could your POA say, talk to me, don't talk to him? Is that what you're asking? Exactly. Oh, oh, I see. Um, no. So if, if you, if you're the, the patient, if you still have mental capacity to understand and make decisions, you still are the first, um, your decisions go. Okay. Your, your agent cannot overstep and overrule you as long as you are still, have still mental capacity. Um, well, the situation was recently, I was asked by medical professionals, they took my history and I was getting facts kind of right. Okay. So if uh, my spouse knew that I was having problems, could she say, you know what? It's going to be a lot easier if you just talk to me. And then, like, it's not even a possibility because I could talk. I could communicate. I was just spouting gibberish. Okay. You, so in a you situation could always, like, You could ahead. always say, I want, I, can you talk to my wife? Yes. Yes, that's what I was going to, yes. So you can always say, I'm not understanding or I'm having a hard time commute. You can always say, yes, speak to her. Or even in that situation, if your spouse says, maybe you should speak with me because he's not really making sense. Uh, I mean, if you don't disagree with that, or if you nod along, then yes, then that's what the medical POA is for. It, so then that's essentially the, the physician's I mean, they're, they're essentially making the decision saying, well, he's not being able to make these decisions on his own or he's not being able to communicate these decisions. So then we're going to talk to his spouse or his agent under the medical POA. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, and we got another question. Will CCDC post a medical POA in living will forms online so we can do it ourselves? Um, that is an option. Uh, I haven't talked to Julie about that yet, but uh, we can definitely do that to make it easier on you guys. Uh, so yes, there is also a living will and medical POA forms are in the statutes, but uh, that's not always the easiest thing to find in the world. So we can definitely post uh, um, blank forms for you guys so that you can fill out on your own if if that if you're comfortable doing that um, otherwise if you still want to speak with speak with me or somebody in the office about how to fill it out or if you have questions we, we can do that as well um, Chris if it makes it easy for you to uh, to have them online so people can fill them up, fill them up and that way the online process is faster send them to me in PDF and I'll make them Feelable. Perfect. Okay. We don't have the time to do it. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, back to the wills. Um, like I said, have to be 18 years old, in a sound mind, knowing where your assets are, what assets you have, and to whom you're going to distribute them. Um, a will, in order to be executed, properly uh, it should be at least signed by two witnesses or notarized um, in order for a will to be what's called self-proven it needs to have both two witnesses and a notary signature on it uh, a self-proved will basically just makes it a lot easier to get through the probate process 
without having a formal probate proceedings with w witnesses coming in to say, yes, I signed this or a notary coming in and said, yes, I signed this. He, he was of sound mind and did not have undue influence. So in a perfect world, you sign your will with a notary and two witnesses on it. Uh, in today's world, that may not be possible and that's okay. Uh, cause Colorado, cause in Colorado, you can just have a notary on a will or two witnesses. Um, you can even have neither of those. It's, it's called a holographic will. You can even have just a will in your own handwriting that's signed by you. And that's okay, uh, under Colorado law, but it's not ideal. And it could, there's possible, uh, compl complications later on with the probate process people challenging it. So that's not ideal. That's really last resort if you want to do a will without a notary or without witnesses. Um, so like I said, ideal world is both two witnesses and a notary, but in today's world, you may just be able to get a notary or two witnesses on it. So uh, Colorado has recently, uh, just yesterday, enacted uh, remote notarization. So that means that in Colorado, you can sign your will in front of a notary and your notary, the notary is just on a video screen, on a Zoom call, on a FaceTime call, something like that. Uh, there are some regulations, some rules on how that procedure goes, but in a nutshell, the notary can watch you sign your document through the computer or through your cell phone. And as long as you are who you say you are, you show your ID to the notary up on the screen and you send the original will original signed will to the notary within 15 days so that he or she can actually stamp it stamp the original with all the the in the notary block and send it back to you then that works just like it normally would with a notary in person um, so James asks, if I'm related to a notary, is there signature binding? Yes. So your, your notary and your witnesses actually can be family members. It can be interested witnesses. Again, it's not ideal. It's always best to have uninterested witnesses and an uninterested notary, but it's not, um, it doesn't disqualify the will. So it's just, we're talking best practices versus what is necessary in today's times. Um, so yeah, so with a will, you can make it very simple. You can just say, this is where I want my assets to go. Um, and um, they can be as simple as two pages, as complex as 25 pages. Uh, I've seen wills and drafted wills of all different shapes and sizes. So uh, wills, I, I, I do wills every day. So if you want to uh, get a will drafted, let me know and we can have a uh, uh, consultation and talk about doing so. So I'll, when it comes to estate planning, I do free consultation. So if you want to do something beyond just a medical POA and a living will, uh, let me know. We'll set up a phone con consultation and get those things in place so that your assets go where you want them to go, just in case uh, something happens to you. Uh, we can make sure those are put in place. So a good estate plan for a family always consists of some some document either a will or a trust saying where your assets go a medical poa for each adult a financial poa for each adult which is essentially um making decisions financial decisions for somebody else for you you choose an agent to make your medical your financial decision for you like you would a medical poa um and a good estate plan is includes a living will will as as well. So those four documents, a will, financial POA, medical POA, and a living will. Um, any questions on wills or other questions on advanced medical directives as well? So what I'm what I'm hearing is that I'm the best presenter ever. I answered everybody's questions, which is good to know. So, um, <laughs> if you have questions, 
because I know how this goes. Five minutes after you, we get off here, you're going to have a question. You can email me. I, I put my email in the chat there, and uh, you can also find my email on the CCDC website, on my website, ccdcprobatepower.com or .org. Um, so email me, call me. Uh, you can call my cell phone as well, since I'm working from home, like any reasonable, like like uh, most people nowadays. So I'm gonna put my cell phone in the chat box as well. So if you have a, a question as well, you can give me a call if you'd rather uh, call than email. Okay. I must be very unreasonable. What was that, Jose? I must be very unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> We've all known that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, are you are you taking questions, related questions, right now? Yeah, uh, sure. If I, I might be. I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, but go for it. I, I, I maybe misunderstood what this meeting was about, but I'm trying to figure out how to. S I have a disabled son. I'm his guardian. He's an adult, and we have a special needs trust. But I know that you're supposed to sort of write down what you want for them after you pass. What you know? What 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 is that called? I'm having trouble finding it. A letter of intent. Um, oh, okay, great. So I, I, there there are people out there who have um, draft letter of intents, letters of intent that uh, kind of prompt you on what you should have in this big massive document on behalf of your adult child with special needs so that when you do pass away everything is listed in there um and i can connect you with those people if that's something you you want me to do and that you can they can help you fill it out and so in that letter of intent you can list who all of his doctors are um, what his favorite foods are what he's allergic to where you want him to possibly live after you pass away, kind of everything under the sun so that okay. when you pass away, whoever becomes his future guardian, essentially you're giving them a guide to your son saying here, here's how to take care of my son and here's what he can do and not do. Um, so it's a really great document um, to have and I can definitely help you connect with them if you want to shoot me an email. Well, I know that, um you know, I once talked to somebody who wanted to spend hours and charge me for hours to work on it. I'd, I'd like to just do at least something sort of basic. Let, let, let me say this as unsolicited. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So he's, my, he's in services. He's in a host home. I mean, he doesn't live with me, but I my, guess my, I need to start somewhere. Yeah, Thanks. My, my opinion is if somebody's charging you just for a letter of intent, don't go to them. Run away. Uh, there are... <laughs> There are, there are many people out there who help with letters of intent, um, who, may, who may charge you for other things like financial advising for your son, which is a good thing to have, but um, the letter of intent part should be free and should be, you should be able to fill that out for free. So I- okay, Thanks a lot. And we have a special needs <laughs> trust, but I think this, now that I have some time, I'm at home. <laughs> right. And thinking of what could I be working on that it just occurred to me, I, I might want to work on that. So thanks a lot. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you guys joining us and let me know if you need anything. I will send PDFs to Jose to put on our website um, here in the next few days so that by, I don't know how quickly he's going to be able to get things up, but hopefully, you know, in the next few days, maybe by the end of the week, we'll have um, templates for you guys to work on um, so you can get those in place. Hey, Chris, it's Ange. Um, hey. If you send it to me, I will include it when I post the recording of the Perfect. webinar and everything. We'll just get it all in one place. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Stay safe, everybody. And <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.